So conditional statements allow us to use logic to determine um, variable um, execution of code. So for example, um, in the example, in Bryce, your example of brushing teeth as a system that we can analyze, um, if we have um, toothpaste on the toothbrush, um, we don't want to start brushing our teeth until we have toothpaste on the toothbrush. So we could say something like, if um, toothbrush dot has paste, And so here we're looking at the has paste attribute of a toothbrush. Um, and, and I'm writing in um, the actual uh, uh, format of uh, P5 of JavaScript that we're going to be using. So we have an if, that's our condition. If this is true, if the toothbrush does indeed have toothpaste, then we're going to execute whatever is inside of these curly brackets. And so then what we're gonna do is we're going to um, say something like toothbrush dot brush um, front teeth. And so here we can, um, we can look at this um, bit of pseudocode, pseudocode meaning code that's not really code, but operates on the same um, logical conditional structure, basically. So um, here we have this attribute, the attribute of this object. Um, and if that is true, like I said, then we are going to um, look at this object, our toothbrush, well, I don't know why I'm pointing at this, our toothbrush object, and then there's a method which is a verb, um, and specifically the difference between a method and a function is uh, methods are attached to objects, right? Brush is something you do with a toothbrush. Brush is not something you do with a dry erase marker, right? So even though brush is a verb, it's only applicable to certain types of nouns, right? I could brush with a hairbrush <laughs> or a toothbrush or paintbrush, but um, let's see, one second. Okay, so I can brush with a toothbrush, hairbrush, or paintbrush, but I can't brush, um, or a street sweeper. Um, I could, but I can't brush with a piano. That doesn't mean anything, right? So here we have a method that is attached to the toothbrush object, and then this method specifically has what's called a parameter. So I'm going to actually just write all these in here. So we have object, method, parameter, attribute. Um, and so a parameter is going to influence how this method is applied, right? We can think about this as, um, do you all remember the difference between a transitive and intransitive verb in English? Um, I brush my teeth. I do something to something versus like I yawn, right? If I yawn, I'm not yawning to anything, but if I walk to the store, that's um, where I'm, I'm applying that method from me, the object, to something else. So um, the parameter is going to change how our method is applied. And I can swap this out. I could swap this out for um, bat. Oh, that marker is not very good. To my back teeth, the tops of my teeth, teeth tops maybe. I can swap out that parameter, and so then I'm going to be using my toothbrush to brush different areas. So um, this now now let's now let's get a little bit more complex with our conditional statement. So um, 
So just really quick, if someone could talk to us, um, what order do you brush your teeth in? Do you do the fronts of your teeth, the backs of your teeth, the tops of your teeth, or do you do like quadrant, 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 quadrant for 30 seconds each? What's the, what's the strategy? Quadrants. Quadrants, quadrants for, yeah, quadrants quadrants. For, for, for how long each quadrant? Probably like 30 seconds, yeah. Yeah, okay. probably like 30 seconds. So, 30 seconds. All right, so now we're going to get to something a little bit more complex. Now we need to introduce a time function, right? So let's just say, let's, um, let's make a variable. Let's make, a, an, um, let's make something that is a clock, basically. So we have a clock. I'll just draw a clock like this. And it's just ticking along, right? So we have the clock. And we can say, um, how long has it been? We'll, we'll just say, um, we'll just call it a timer, actually. This is more complex than actual code, which we'll get to later on in the semester. But at least we can get to the thought process of this. Right? So we can say, let's just write our simple one again. So we have if um, tooth, toothbrush dot has paste. Toothbrush dot brush. Front, uh, or quadrant one, we'll say. Which is a quad one. And so this semicolon here, you don't need to totally um, understand why this is something, but this is just the end of a line of code. So um, when I'm executing code, I'm going to have a semicolon at the end of each line of code. Um, this conditional structure is a little bit different. We don't need a semicolon um, for, for these two things because it's like a parenthetical thing. But um, OK, so we have toothbrush dot brush quadrant one. And so now what we're going to do, we're going to say, um, if we're going we're gonna to nest this. So we can, we can have our conditional statement inside of another conditional statement. So if timer is less than 30 seconds. So you remember your uh, operate, your, your comparators, I hope, from math class, um, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, not equal to. Um, we'll go over those in a moment, but if timer is less than 30, and I'll do my curly bracket and I'll just go around everything else. So now our timer is gonna tick up to 30, run our code, and then not run again, right? Um, which is pretty cool for that one quadrant of teeth that we've gotten brushed, but not so great for the rest of our mouth, right? So now what we need to do is we need to do two things. We need to, one, reset our timer. Let's see. And we can imagine that there is a method attached to our timer object called timer.reset. Um, and oftentimes with methods, you can see that there's a method, um, you can tell a method by the existence of these parentheses here, where there might be an optional parameter for that method. And so now, our timer is going to click up to 30, reset back to zero, click up to 30, and we're just going to keep brushing that one quadrant of our mouth over and over and over and over, which is not very helpful, once again, for the rest of our mouth. So we need to change what's happening inside of this, OK? So what we can do is we can, instead of calling it quad one, maybe, we can just call it one. Or um, yeah, for now, let's just call it one to make our lives simpler. And so now, if we have our quadrants numbered just one, two, three, four, now what we can do is we can just increase this number by one. 
and move through our quadrants, right? So I'm going to run out of room on my board pretty quick. So maybe um, this point I'm going to switch to typing. So I'm going to go back over to my other screen and share my screen. OK. All right, so bear with me for a moment while I get this open. Um, and so I'm going to be using the P5 editor. So I'm just going to um, share a link to that in the chat in case you don't have that at the ready. And I'm going to share my screen. Give me one moment. OK. So here I have the P5 editor. And I'm just going to move this stuff out of the way a little bit. Ugh. All right, so once again, the code that I'm about to write is not going to run because we haven't, um, we haven't defined what a toothbrush is in terms of the code. We're just worrying about the conditional structure. So I'm actually, I'm going to delete this stuff for now. Um, and I'm going to say, um, so what was it? If timer is less than 30, And so now this is a good way, um, a good thing to point out now. Um, keeping your code organized is something that is generally helpful. Um, so like using indentations can be very helpful for making sure you understand what's going on in there. So if timer is less than 30, and if toothbrush dot um, has paste, And we can say tooth brush dot brush one. All right. And so, um, and then after that, we need to do a timer dot reset. Okay. So, like I said, now we're we're brushing up our um, first quadrant of our teeth for thirty seconds and then resetting, and then brushing our quadrant for 30 seconds over and over and over. There's no end to this. So if we were running this code um, through our practice of brushing our teeth, we would never, ever stop brushing our teeth. We would brush our teeth until we died, until, or until the end of time. Um, so that's not going to do. So now what we need to do, we need to think about, OK, so what do we need to do here? We need to change this number. So we can say, let's say tooth, oh, sorry, not toothbrush. We'll say, um, okay, how do we make this number change? Um, we need to, first of all, introduce a variable. So um, a variable um, is, we use that term very similarly to the way it's used in algebra, where it is a symbol or um, a placeholder that can um, take on a different value, right? So um, I'm going to say we're going to make a variable called quadrant quad num quadrant number. We'll just we'll start it out equaling one. So now we're going to start out with our variable quad num equaling one, and I'm going to just say quad num here. So now nothing's changed with the way this code is going to run. But now, instead of just having one in here, we're referring to a variable that we've made. Um, and now I want to point out one other thing with uh, the way JavaScript works. Um, none of this would actually work. I mean, it'll, it'll crash, because if I try it, it says, hey, that's not defined. We haven't said what timer is. We haven't said what quadnum is. We haven't said what toothbrush is. We don't know any of these things. Um, so right now, we're just, like I said, we're just worrying about how conditional structures can work. So um, now, um, to make this so that we don't just brush the same part of our teeth over and over and over and over, we need to change the value 
of this variable. So I'm just going to make a comment. And a comment is a piece of code, um, or sorry, a piece of text in your code that's not going to be run as code. It's a note. It's a comment. It's a, uh, it's a bit of text to clarify something for you or another programmer. So I'm just going to say here, quad num is our variables name. And one is its value. Okay. And I'll specify that it's its initial value because we are going to change that. So what we're going to do is now, when we reset our timer, we're also going to want to change this value. So I'm going to do something called an increment. And an increment is where we're going to add 1 to the value of some variable. So I'll say quad num plus plus. And I'll make another comment. Adding, oh, adding plus plus to the end of a variable adds one, and I'll just say plus one Oop. to that variable's value. And so now, does someone actually, maybe I wanna, I wanna see if we have a, someone from the class who can tell us what's going to happen. So we start out with, our quad num value being one. We're going to count to 30 while brushing one quadrant. We're going to reset our timer. And we're going to add one to our quadrant. So can I have a volunteer to tell us what's going to happen with, uh, if this is the script that we go through to brush our teeth? Um. Yeah, go for it, Kyle. Um, each time it brushes, it changes the quad num, so it brushes a different place. Right. So, what what are the values of quad num as we go through this? So we start at one, and then what's next? Two, and then three, and then no. What? Sorry. It will continue to count up. Right. So after three comes four. And then, wait, what happens after four? It still continues. Uh, it still continues, but we've run out of teeth. What are we brushing? Yeah. Are we brushing someone else's teeth? What are we doing? It doesn't mean anything anymore, right? We can't brush the fifth quadrant of our teeth because that isn't a place. So now we need to include another conditional, um, another condition. So let's just further nest it. We'll say, if quad num is less, less than, than, let me just uh, make sure everybody's muted. Um, all right, so um, we need to make sure that the quad num doesn't get greater than four. So we're going to say if quad num is great, less than or equal to four, Then we'll do all of this. So now I'm going to go through and just put my tabs in so I can keep my indentation nice and clean. So there we go. So now we're going to run through this and um, it should work OK. I mean, this isn't perfect because it doesn't handle how we're looping this, but now you can see like we're only, we want to make sure we don't try to brush past how many teeth we have. Um, okay. Does that make, does that make sense to y'all? I hope. Um, is the timer going to count though, even though it's not been defined or it's... So that's the thing. I mean, the, we're, no, in this, in this code, <laughs> um, in, in this code that I was showing, no, the timer wouldn't actually work because there's a lot of code that we, like a lot of stuff that we should have um, already defined. But that's a little bit more complex than I want to get to on um, this early on in the class. We are definitely going to get to that um, 
later on how to actually use timers. Um, but right now, I just wanted to get the idea of this conditional structure. So I hope that that conditional architecture made sense. Yeah, I was just wondering about the timer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, um, there's, a, there's a good bit in that code that would not run at all um, because there's a lot of um, further deep stuff that we need to do. Um, OK. So um, I'm going to switch back to my other camera. Um, because that, um, that brought up, there's a few things, a few bits of background knowledge that we may need to make sure that we have um, before we continue on. And those are the things that I just erased are comparators. So comparators compare two things. Pretty straightforward. So we have less than, oops, sorry, that's greater than. Less than, greater than, uh, less than or equal to, I'm just gonna say LT or equal, greater than or equal and not equal. Um, and so these are going to be extremely, extremely important for when you're working with code once we get going with that. So um, now let's, let's show how we write these in our code because I, writing something like that character is not the easiest thing with a standard keyboard. These ones we have already. So let's write them in how they're written in PyPy. So we have less than, greater than, less than or equal to, which is just a less than symbol followed by an equal sign, greater than or equal to, which is a greater than sign followed by an equal sign, and not equal to as an exclamation point followed by an equal sign. And uh, this exclamation point we will use um, in other places to mean not. Um, so you can proceed any, um, uh, I mean, you can proceed other things with an exclamation point to mean the inverse, the negative of that thing, or not that thing. So put this down in your notes that I hope you are taking, um, because these are going to be very important. Um, all right. And now it's time to talk about types of variables that we can use. So variables and objects are very closely related. Because they both have a data type. And data type you can think of as the difference between um, something like the number um, 66 as a number versus the number um, uh, 4.2 versus um, the word, um, let's see, um, you can also put something in quotes. We'll say uh, envelope. So all of these are different data types, right? This is what's called an integer, which you may remember from, um, <clears throat> excuse me, from um, a math class. An integer is a whole number. Um, it can be positive or negative. So we'll give, let's give some other examples of an integer. We have negative 1, 0, negative 99, uh, 1,000. All, all of those are integers. Um, <clears throat> and in 
our in our programming language. Uh, yeah, I don't need to go any further than that on integers. Um, we also have numbers that have decimal points. So these are called floating point numbers. Because we have this decimal point that we put in somewhere. So we, let's do some other examples of floating point numbers. We can have 0. 0.0001. We could have 1.312. Um, we could have 9.8, whatever. Something with a decimal point in there. And now this one. This is something called a string. And a string is multiple characters stuck together. So before we get there, let's, let's go a little bit further. Let's say just that one letter, this is a character. And so an envelope is a string of characters. So a string could be something like hello, or it could be um, um, Dolce and Gabbana. Does Gabbana have two ends? I don't know, whatever. And you see, we, we, we're not limited to just English letters. We can use symbols like ampersands. Um, I'll just keep going here, 100%. Also, we can have percentage signs, and then this is where it can get a little confusing. We can have numerical characters in a string. And the way, the way, the way that I like to think about this is this 100 in a string that is 100%, remember that this, this character that we are looking at, this number one, it's a picture that represents the number one, right? I can say um, two like this, this is just as good at conveying the number two as that symbol is, right? These both represent a number, but this is really just a picture. I just drew a picture that represents the number. So when we have a string that has numbers in it, these are just the characters that represent the number. They're not actually the numbers. So you can't like multiply 100% a string by um, like 70. You can't multiply a string by a number because that's the same as saying like, what is um, papaya minus 3.2? Papaya minus 3.2, that doesn't mean anything, right? So this is why we have to be careful and aware of our data types when we're working. All right. So these are, oh, and a, and a character is just one character. So it could be, let me say like, it can be one, oh, A, and um, this is one thing to keep in mind. A lowercase and an uppercase are different characters. It can be, a percentage sign, whatever. Anything that's on your keyboard, that's a character. And stuff that's not even on your keyboard. There's more characters than are on your keyboard. Um, oh yeah, like such as like a NEA, right? That's a character, but it's not on at least my English keyboard. All right, so those are our basic um, data types, but then there's more complex stuff that take the form of objects. So um, one of the objects that we were speaking of uh, today, an example one, we can define an object such as toothbrush. Now, we haven't done this in code yet, but let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so I'm actually, I'm going to erase this so I have some room to work with. Okay, so toothbrush is our example, right? Toothbrush 
is an example of an object. But I have a toothbrush, you have a toothbrush, the rest of you have toothbrushes, right? So that means that there are at least, there's 17 people in this meeting. So that means there's at least 17 of these in the world. So how do we differentiate, if we're thinking about this in terms of code, how do we differentiate between my toothbrush and your toothbrush and your toothbrush and your toothbrush? Um, the way that we want to think about this is that there is an idea of a toothbrush, right? Um, like we can think about it like at the factory, there's a mold that they, they pour molten plastic and rubber into and then it opens and then you pull out a toothbrush, right? So that mold is what defines what that toothbrush object is. And that mold is an idea of, is, the, is an example of a class. So a class is, well, I'll just say is the idea of an object. And each individual object is what's called an instance of a class. So instance of a class, that's something that we definitely want to get into your notes as well. Um, that's a very important concept because um, in our, in our pseudocode that we wrote, right, we were saying that we had an object named toothbrush. Um, but it might make more sense to think about toothbrush as the class and uh, Bryce's toothbrush as the object that we're using. Um, all right, does that, does that make sense, I hope? Does anyone have any questions so far? No. Okay. Oh, can you, I'm sorry, but can you repeat that again? Um, uh, how far back? Just like around the, around the end, like when you were about to finish, I didn't hear Oh, that. okay. Okay, so, um, so what I was saying is basically like, we each have a tooth, I'm, I'm gonna go away from toothbrushes actually. Let's forget about toothbrushes, I'll use another example. Because I, um, I don't have any toothbrushes in the room with me, so that might be not the best example to use. Let's go with marker. All right, so this is a marker. So are all of these, right? These are all markers, yet they're individual objects, right? They each are um, in they each embody the idea of a marker, but they're each their own thing. So I can say that marker is the class, class, I'll say the class of object. And each one of these is an instance of that class. So, um, I'll do it in another color. Any individual marker, any individual or specific marker is an instance of a class. So, um, yeah, so like I said, these are all markers. Um, my other markers are behind my whiteboard. Let me just see if I can grab one real quick. This Sharpie is also a marker, but it's a different type. So there can be different attributes of markers, right? So like this, I need to be careful. I've done it before where I do this example and then I write on my whiteboard with Sharpie. So I'm gonna put that over there. But so each instance of this marker class can have different attributes, right? Like these pens have attributes, these markers, excuse me, have attributes such as red, orange, green, purple, but they all also share um, certain attributes 
like erasable. This marker is not erasable, so it, share, it has a different attribute there. Um, these also all share similar methods, right? I can write with them. I can also write with this. So um, this is a throwback to something that we talked about in our previous class, where I wanted you to note something special about the um, peanut butter and jelly that we were using, right? Peanut butter and jelly in the, in the peanut butter and jelly sandwich exercise, both can be opened and spread and closed. Um, so they all share certain methods and attributes, right? So this is what I wanted to say that, that um, we could think about peanut butter and jelly both as instances of the sandwich spread class. And by um, having these different instances with different um, uh, attributes, some shared and some different, we can um, save space in our um, coding environment and, and reuse certain bits of code. Um, did that address your question, I hope? Or the, the what was unclear? Yeah, I understand that better now. Okay, great. Um, okay, let me see, let me refer to my notes. All right. Um, so, there are more, um, there, there are plenty more data types and types of objects than I went through. Um, but in P5, luckily, um, we don't have to worry about um, naming them all of the time or at the, at the beginning of our code. Um, and this is one for the notes also. Um, so um, Arduino, when we get to um, the Arduino section of class, we're going to be dealing then with um, an explicitly typed language. I want to say Arduino. But P5 is not. Um, and so explicitly typed means, so explicit means it's like very plain as they made clear, said plainly and concretely. And typed, we mean um, the data type. So if I wanted to have an integer in Arduino, I would have to say int, um, and then I would have a, a variable name. So let's just say quad num equals one. Um, can you all can you all read this through the Zoom meeting? I'm not sure if the connection's good enough, or if I need to write uh, larger. Um. Yeah, I can see. Okay, you can read it. Okay, great. So um, in Arduino, we have to say our data type. In P5, we don't. Um, and so, but we do have to tell the programming language that we are defining a variable. So we would just say, let quad num equal one. And we could say, I had a little dyslexic backwards writing thing there. One second. Let timer equal um, 0, 0.0. So this is an integer. This is a floating point number. But in P5, we don't need to tell it that. Um, P5 will look at the data that you put in and then do the rest in the background for you. Um, all right. See here. Um, okay, so I'm just checking my notes. Um, okay, I think there's just one more thing that I want to get into before we take a little break, and then we'll get back together to um, 
to do the um, next step of this thing. So um, I want to talk about a, a bit of computer science theory really quick. And this is called Mars levels of analysis. And so there's three levels. I'm going to use a different color pen. So the first one is what's called computational. So right now, this doesn't mean anything to us because what are we analyzing? We're analyzing some sort of programmatic or computational system. So um, let's, just, let's just look at, um, we'll go back to teeth brushing. That's a pretty easy one um, for this. So a computational analysis of teeth brushing is, let's, let's say, example, teeth brushing. So a computational analysis of the process of brushing teeth would be um, use toothbrush to make teeth clean. It's a very um, like air, like very uh, wide view, wide world view of what the goal is. The goal is to have clean teeth using this toothbrush object. So, um, so that is very simple. Now let's look at the next level, which is algorithmic. And the algorithmic level is what we were doing with our exercise. That's the logical structure. Um, so this would be um, like uh, move through quadrants uh, or cycle through quadrants maybe, cycle through quadrants, uh, moving brush with hand um, in this way for this amount of time. Basically, this is the, the exercise we did. Exercise we did. Where we're defining how the system actually accomplishes this goal. How do we accomplish this goal? So how to accomplish. And now we're going to get to the last level which is the implementational. And the implementational is um, even lower level, more specific where we're talking about all of this stuff, but also things like, um, so it includes all algorithmic, but also has physical things. So like, um, it's, it's how it's actually done. So like what plastic is used, what plastic is used in the brush, what the spacing of the bristles is, and any other um, physical descriptions of how this thing is actually happening. So for example, with like, um, I don't have my battery here, but um, for, for like, if, if we're talking about like a, a cell phone, the computational um, definition or analysis of a cell phone is, or I mean of a smartphone, um, is a device that has um, connectivity that can do different computations and communicate um, and also uh, create sounds and visual imagery. The algorithmic then is much more complicated talking about communication protocols and um, all of this other stuff. And then the implementation can say like, oh, and the screen is made of silica mined in this location. Um, the batteries are made of lithium from 
um, Bolivia and so on and so forth. Um, and this is made with this process in a factory. Um, these are the steps of the conveyor belt to create it. Um, now, I mean, cell phone, that's a, that's a hard one, but what I am really wanting to get to with this is these levels of analysis don't have to just be used on something that already exists, right? You can look at an object um, and analyze it using this, but this is also helpful for creating something, right? If you want to make a product that um, keeps track of how many calories you've burned um, pacing back and forth in your house, um, then you can address it through these levels of, of complexity in order to better define what needs to be done. Um, it can also be done for um, works of interactive art, right? If you want to um, have your audience come to some conclusion, you can define that computationally and then figure out how to make that happen and then what physical objects are best suited to make that happen. 